Ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you Civil Aviation Minister Jyotiraditya Sindhya. Big round of applause uh, for Mr. <laughs> Jyotiraditya Sindhya for gracing the India Economic uh, Conclave. Mr. Jyotiraditya Sindhya, nine years, a lot has been achieved. Are you totally satisfied with the sector that you head in terms of the strides that have been made, 43% uh, passenger traffic uh, above last year's level? Uh, do you think you thought about this happening in the manner it has? And do you think uh, this is going to continue, the growth story in the aviation sector? So, Navika, first of all, thank you very much for having me, and it's always a pleasure to be at this uh, conference, um, to be hosted by Navika, and uh, to hope against hope that she doesn't grill you, but nevertheless. Um, let me say this, that um, the transportation sector in India has gone through a uh, huge change over the last nine years. Uh, I think you are sitting on the cusp, uh, even with this growth, of a revolution. Uh, and that the underpinning of that, uh, Navika, if I may, are based upon uh, four fundamental precepts that have transformed India in the last, last nine years under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi. The first, of course, is the fact that India today is the only bright, shining star on the economic paradigm uh, across the world, growing at 6.1% uh, on a compounded uh, annual growth rate basis. Uh, and don't forget that um, the magic in an economic story uh, lies not necessarily in blips of economic growth of 10% or 9% or 8%, but really a, uh, uh, a CAGA uh, of upwards of five, five and a half percent that transforms lives across across the world. Um, and same has been the story uh, in the U.S., uh, a country that uh, one looks at in terms of its economic uh, uh, strength. Uh, the U.S. grew at two percent, but it grew at two percent for a hundred years. And that's what transformed the U.S. story. So the first is uh, uh, economic growth. The second is the increasing urbanization that's uh, happening in India. Uh, India over the last nine years has uh, today grown to uh, roughly about 34% of our population uh, living in urban uh, agglomerates. And that number is only going to grow uh, by the year 2030 to close to about 40%. Uh, that brings with it a tremendous amount of latent demand. Uh, third is uh, the increasing disposable income. Um, uh, among all our people across the length and breadth of India. And finally, the fourth, which I believe is uh, one of the most important factors, is the aspirations of us as Indians has, has uh, really reached new heights. So I think these four fundamental precepts are bringing about a, tra a fundamental transformation in the way the transportation sector is, is changing. Civil aviation, 2013-14, uh, we transported roughly about 6 crore passengers domestically. Last year, we transported close to about 14.5 crore passengers domestically. So the sector itself has doubled, or more than doubled, in the last nine years. And if you ask me honestly, number for 2030, I'm looking at this sector going at from 14.5 crore passengers to close to 45 crore passengers. So that's the kind of growth numbers that you're looking at in the next seven to eight years. Uh, with the tremendous amount and desire for people to travel. Uh, underpinning of that is a change in the way we are rolling out the sector. India built uh, 74 airports from independence till 2013. That's roughly about 66 years, uh, 2014, 67 years. And in the last nine years, we have built 74 airports, heliports, and water drones, double that number to 148. So what India managed to do in 67 years, we have done in the last nine years. But the journey has just started. And uh, through this conference, I'd like to inform our viewers as well, 
we've pegged the number really high over the next four years. We plan to take this number from 148 to upwards of 200 airports, water drones, and heliports in India uh, over the next four to five years. So that's the kind of potential that we're looking at going forward, both in terms of passenger traffic and in terms of infrastructure. Mr. Sindhya, you made a statement that you have a massive game plan coming up for the aviation se uh, sector. Since you made uh, that remark, people have stopped breathing. They're waiting for you to unveil the massive game plan. Uh, on the India Economic Conclave, would you want uh, our audiences to know what that massive game plan is all about? So that's a, that's a good follow-up question because once you uh, uh, define your mission and, and the growth drivers in demand, then the next plausible question is how are you going to make sure that you're able to service that demand? And I'm in a, I'm in a service industry, I'm in a service business. Uh, and therefore, the two fundamental, again, precepts based with that, if you look at airports, when I talk about the fact that we're going to grow from 148 to almost 200, 220 airports over the next four to five years, uh, we have close to a 98,000 crore capex plan in place for the next three to four years. Uh, that is going to be driven not only by the private sector, but it's going to be driven by the private sector and the public sector through Airports Authority of India. Airports Authority of India will roughly do a capex between 32 to 34,000 crores out of those 98,000 crores, which will cover 42 greenfield airports and three uh, 42 brownfield airports and three greenfield airports, of, one, of which one we've already built in Holongi in Arunachal Pradesh at a cost of uh, roughly about 750 crores. The private sector, uh, through that, the capex number that I just talked about, roughly about 60,000 crores odd, uh, will, will expand capacity in four uh, brownfield airports and build out an additional three uh, greenfield airports. Uh, so that being the plan, from a macro perspective, civil aviation has always worked on a hub and spoke policy. So when you uh, look at uh, uh, both the hubs and the spokes, uh, we've got six metros in our country. Our current throughput capacity in our six metros, which is Bombay, Delhi, Kolkata, Hyderabad, Bengaluru, Chennai, uh, those six metros are roughly about 220 million throughput on an annual basis. In the next three to four years, that throughput on the six airports, including Jaywar and Navi Mumbai, which are coming up, will go to a 425 million. So those are the numbers that we're talking about. Delhi Airport today services roughly about uh, 70 million passengers. Uh, we're going to grow that number to 109 million by the end of this year with, another, with a new fourth terminal and a new runway. Uh, it's going to become one of the largest airports in the world today, even beyond Atlanta. That's the kind of scale that civil aviation is, is going to grow at. When you look at aircrafts, because you've got to have aircrafts that when you're expanding airport capacity, we had roughly about 400 aircrafts in 2013-14. We've grown that fleet by almost 75% to 700 aircraft. And my rough back of the envelope number for the next five to seven years is this 700 should easily go to 1,200 uh, or 1,400. So you're going to have a huge uh, increase in your fleet capacity. And mind you, when I talk about fleet capacity and I talk about airports, we're not only talking about big cities, tier one cities in India. It's our initiative to take civil aviation to tier two and tier three cities. And therefore, last mile connectivity for me is extremely important. So I'm not only concentrating on international traffic, on Airbus and 737s, but also sub 20 seater aircrafts your Cessna citations, your smaller aircraft, looking at helicopters in terms of last mile connectivity into northeast areas, into hilly states, into Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, through Uran, we are bringing about a new uh, round. We did uh, Uran 4.2, which looked at only small aircraft and hel helicopters, close to about 186 routes. Uran 5.1, which I'm going to bring out in the next couple of months, will again look only at helicopters. Because taking last mile connectivity down uh, to the grassroots level is one of the PM's uh, most important projects which we're going to make sure that we deliver on for all our people across the country. Mr. Sindhya, let me now ask an Aam Admi question. And we have a viewer who has sent us a question who says that Delhi to late tickets today cost 52,000 rupees 
and Delhi to Paris, 56,000 rupees. Now, do you think uh, there's any comparison between the ticket prices, especially to some of these routes, uh, uh, which, which are skyrocketing all the time, and, uh, you know, passengers in low-cost airlines, so-called low-cost airlines, have to shell out a huge sum? So first, let me add a caveat and say that uh, um, civil aviation is a deregulated sector. Okay, And uh, the last thing that, Navika, you, uh, I'm sure, would be auguring for is to start regulating a deregulated sector, because then... Uh, for all the years that you've been in this business, you'll be uh, going in reverse gear from what you've been advocating throughout your career. But that being said, um, I think still Maybe it is... Maybe the regulator is... needs a nudge? Sorry? Is the regulator looking at these uh, prices? Do they need a nudge? Because so, these are questions correct, people are asking. Correct, asked. correct. So the point that I was trying to make to you, and I'm going to try and make that point once again, is that we are a deregulated sector, right? In 1993... Uh, in fact, my father brought in open sky policy, as you well recall, and we deregulated the civil aviation sector. So there is no regulator for uh, pricing affairs. Uh, but having said that, I think it's important to understand the dynamics uh, across which this industry works. And there are two dynamics that are in play today. Uh, one, uh, very clearly, the civil aviation sector and the industry is a seasonal industry. So you have high points uh, which start in uh, festive season in October. So October through Jan is high season for this industry. Then you go into a lull starting Jan until uh, April, May when the summer season kicks in and holidays and all of that sort of season uh, starts, which is what we're going through right now. And therefore you have high demand that steps in again, which then peters off uh, prior to monsoon. So A, we are a seasonal industry, and therefore there are crests and troughs from a demand point of view. B, we've had an uh, unusual situation and an unusual uh, crisis that we've had to deal with. The sector that you've talked about, and very rightfully so, uh, used to be serviced by GoFirst. Uh, and the very fact that uh, GoFirst has applied at NLC, uh, to NLCT and has uh, going through its restructuring which means that there's been a pullback from the 315-odd routes that they were applying, uh, has meant that there has been an excess demand on the routes that they were applying. Now, we've given additional routes to other airlines, but it's a very uh, piquant situation, if I may use that word, because uh, I doubt whether any sector has kind of seen the vicissitudes that civil aviation has seen over the last three years. Three years ago, you had a time when all your planes were sitting on the ground and there was not a single passenger for any one of these aircraft. And today, we have all our aircraft up in the air, but we don't have enough aircraft to service the demand. And the reason why we don't have enough aircraft is because the main suppliers of aircraft across the world, whether it's Airbus or it's Boeing or engine suppliers, Pratt & Whitney, all have supply chain issues. And therefore, they're not able to service in terms of the demand that is out there. Now, one of the main reasons that we have this kind of piquant situation is also because of the supply chain issue with, uh, with regard to Pratt & Whitney. Uh, but having said that, I uh, have put together a group uh, as we speak in the last couple of days. Uh, we are doing our analysis in-house on a lot of these routes. One of the two airports that have been, or two destinations, if you will, that have been affected the most uh, by this unusual event uh, is one Srinagar and the second is Pune, slightly Ahmedabad. Uh, and we're doing a full analysis on this. And we will speak to our airlines to make sure that fares are within a certain level and we will try our best. But it's an it's a issue that has been created due to an unforeseen demand supply imbalance, which was not the case last year. Mr. Sindhya, um, the deregulated sector, as you say, petroleum is also deregulated. But uh, it's often seen, uh, and I can give you statistic uh, information, I can send it across to your office, where that whenever there are elections around the corner, somehow the deregulation goes on hold. Uh, and then just post-elections, the deregulation comes back. Uh, are we waiting for elections? I, I don't, in no, the I don't think you can compare civil aviation and uh, petroleum, to be very honest. Uh, uh, because even though... Uh, 
Uh, we've done away with APM. There is, at the end of the day, most of the refining companies and the ENP companies, the exploration production companies, are still under the government's ambit. There are no carriers today apart from Alliance Air, which has 16 ATRs or 22 ATRs that are within the ambit of government. So we are truly a deregulated sector, even though when we had Air India under our fold, there was no regulation on ticket pricing. And that has been the case through successive governments, whether it was uh, our government or a Congress government or maybe a, a third front government or so on and so forth. But having said that, as I mentioned to you, that it's something that is on my table. It's something that is being analyzed today. And in the next couple of days, once that analysis comes through, and where you see a great degree of volatility uh, between, let's say, 14-day pricing or 30-day pricing and one-day pricing, we shall certainly speak to the airlines. But as you are also well aware, the industry goes through something called an RBD, which is reservation bucket designators. And this is an international practice. Uh, and if you and I book a ticket, let's say 30 down, days down the road, you will get it at rock bottom prices. But if it is a spot ticket, which is for tomorrow, then there is a high degree of volatility, whether you look at international travel, domestic travel, internationally that is the practice. Point one. Point two, you also have to understand, Navika, and this is not directly related to your question, but it's important. Uh, air turbine fuel is close to about 40% of the cost structure of an airline. And ATF price pre-COVID used to be 53,000 rupees a kiloliter odd, somewhere around there. Today, ATF pricing is close to about 1,7,000 rupees a kiloliter. So when input cost has gone up by a, over 100%, and that is 40% of your cost structure, and for airlines that are not making money or just about turning around, that also becomes 40% of your revenue structure. And therefore, the levers that you have control over are fairly limited. And so these are situations that we're grappling with. One of the things that I did in the last two, two and a half years, looking at this financial structure of, of uh, the industry, uh, is to look at what are the levers that we can work with. And one of the things that jumped out at me was the fact that we had within our country only about 12 states that charged VAT on ATF, ranging between 1% to 4%. And we had 24 states and union territories in our country that charged VAT on ATF, ranging between 20 to 30 percent. So imagine the double whammy. Your ATF price doubles by 100 percent. On that, you have to pay an additional 20 to 30 percent VAT on ATF. Where is the sense of running that business? And therefore, I went out to a number of states because civil aviation, the whole the comp complexion of the industry has changed. The economic multipliers, the employment multipliers that it brings with it are tremendous. And so we approached every state and union territory over the last year and a half and two years. And I'm really glad to report to you uh, and through, through you to our viewers that 19 states and union territories, on my persistence, on my pleading, and I must thank the chief ministers and the lieutenant governors of those states, big states, small states, island states, hilly states, northern states, southern states, across the board. Opposition states, BJP Op states? Some opposition states, some, uh, some BJP states, across the board. All have lowered VAT, 19 states, from 20 to 30 percent down to 1 to 4 percent. So a situation where you had a matrix, 12 states low VAT, 24 states high VAT, and now has now become 31 states low VAT and only five states high VAT. Now I'm urging the other five states to come on board. Uh, else, from an economies of scale point of view, they will not get the benefits that other states will get through greater access to civil aviation. Which are these five states? Delhi to start with, uh, West Bengal, um, Tamil Nadu, uh, Assam, and we have one more. I'm missing the name of the fifth, but five states in all. Mr. Sindhya, uh, the question of... Uh... And so through you, I'd like to urge them again that please come on board. You have a I sliding... Hope... You have a, and I know you're very persuasive, right? So, so an endorsement from Navika in, in public interest to make sure that flyers get, get more advantages. You have to come on board because... And honestly speaking, civil aviation, you know, the, the whole uh, complexion of this industry, 30, 40 years ago, you could only set up an airport and provide air connectivity where there was 
great economic activity. That paradigm has changed on its head. Today, where you have an airport and air connectivity is where economic activity takes place. The first question an investor asks whenever he visits any state and someone asks him to invest there, what's your airplane connectivity? And the reason, the, the next question you should ask me is why? And the reason is that in the last 40 years, only one thing has changed. There's only one thing of which we have a surfeit of. And there is no substitute. And that is time. No one today has time. Everyone wants to get from one place to the next in the shortest possible time and come back in the shortest possible time. And therefore, air connectivity has now become no longer a luxury, but a necessity. And therefore, even for states with an economic multiplier of close to 3.5 and an employment multiplier of close to 6.1, today, civil aviation has become the, the foundation on which economic growth happens across states and across countries. So on behalf of the common people of this country, citizens of this country, I think uh, we will request Mr. Arvind K. Jival, uh, Ms. Mamta Banerjee, Mr. M. K. Stalin, Mr. Himanta Biswasarma, and an unknown fifth chief minister to please listen Bihar, to... Bihar, sorry, I forgot, Bihar. Bihar, Nitish. So four out of five, four out of five I, I, are I, opposition I, rules. I cannot, have, I cannot have Navika on a show, show saying unknown person. Yeah, because I would have caught uh, the other one and then uh, sent a link, but uh, great. Uh, uh, four, uh, four of them are opposition rule states. Uh, we hope they are listening. Uh, and, and if uh, uh, the citizens of this country are facing uh, problems, uh, then uh, please do listen to this one. Himanta Biswasarma, maybe you just need to make a phone call? Oh, I'm, I'm at it. Don't trust me, I'm at it. Okay, all right. So let me also ask you, uh, in 2019, we saw one uh, airline going under, Jet Airways, and now go first. Uh, A, are we expecting go first to come up and start running again, as they have uh, been saying? Uh, and, and second question related to this is that uh, not allowing the leasing uh, companies to pick up these aircrafts, is it going to upset the Indian markets uh, uh, or, or their ratings uh, in the long run? So let me respond to that saying first with a caveat that uh, it's not my remit to get into a contractual issue between two parties. And clearly there is a contractual, contractual issue here. But having said that, I, I do find it uh, slightly strange and rather unpalatable, uh, if you will, uh, that an airline um, whose fleet is roughly about 58 to 60 aircraft has close to 50% of its fleet on AOG position, aircraft on ground, so grounded. And the reason why they're grounded is because the engines are not serviceable. Um, now, it's a subjudice issue uh, as to who's at fault, and so I, therefore I don't want to get into that. Uh, but clearly, there is a situation that has developed within our market, uh, which is a huge burgeoning market, as I've just uh, explained to you, where, ironically or strangely, most of the aircrafts that are on ground belong to one engine manufacturer. And that, to me, is an issue of concern. Uh, and we have spoken uh, with that engine manufacturer that India is not a country where we can afford to have our planes on the ground, especially looking at the demand numbers. Uh, Pre-COVID, we hit a high of 425,000 on a particular day. Uh, this year, successively, we've hit uh, a new high of 4,56,000 uh, on a daily basis, ranging between 370 to 390, 400, 420. And therefore, I am looking at forecasting this demand this festive season, Navika, to maybe even touch five lakhs. And therefore, we need every aircraft in India in the air. Um, as, far, as far as what is in uh, store for Go, air, go, go First going forward, uh, we had written to them uh, in uh, the third week of May, saying, please come up with your uh, restructuring plan so that we can evaluate it and assess it uh, and come back to you. 
Uh, they came back to us with something, I believe, on the 25th of May. Uh, we have looked at that document, we've identified the loopholes, what needs to be worked at uh, by them, uh, and we are waiting for a, a revert from them. But I certainly hope they're up in the air as soon as possible. Uh, to your last question in terms of uh, lessors being able to repossess their aircraft, uh, as I said, NLCT, uh, NLCT has passed a moratorium order. Uh, lessors are still in court, so it's a subjudice matter. Uh, but we are uh, doing our work from a regulatory side in terms of putting together the international framework uh, to make sure that uh, uh, lessors are also well protected. Mr. Sindhya, nine years and yesterday the growth numbers that have come in, 7.2% GDP growth, uh, which has proved wrong uh, some of uh, the renowned uh, economists like Mr. Raghuram Rajan, who said India would find it difficult to surpass the 5% growth number. And of course, uh, the statements being made by Mr. Rahul Gandhi in the United States uh, about how uh, India uh, is, is bad on every possible count. Uh, why are you not able to convince the opposition, number one? And uh, why do you think some of these economists uh, still do not see India as a bright spot? Well, uh, if you want me to put it succinctly, uh, we can only convince those who are open and willing to be convinced. Uh, we cannot convince those who have a closed mind uh, due to their own self-servicing ideologies and philosophies. Uh, uh, if you look at India's story over the last nine years and you look at the transformation for you and I as a common person, uh, whether it's on the infrastructure basis, whether it's on social welfare schemes, whether it is in terms of connectivity, whether it is in terms of eradicating middlemen and corruption. Uh, I remember there was a statement by a famous opposition leader who said that uh, every rupee that is sent from the center, only 15 paise reaches uh, the common man. And today you have in place uh, a leader within India where at the touch of a button from Delhi, if it's 6,000 rupees as Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi going into the bank account of a farmer sitting in Bamori district in Guna, for example, that money reaches electronically in that instant into that person's account. That kind of transparency was never heard of in India. The fact that you've created 50 crore Jandhan accounts in India the fact that you've got a UPI transfer interface. Look at what we went through to, through COVID. The whole world was never prepared for what happened. And it's only within India that when A, you got 220 crore vaccinations done in a country of this size, impossible by any standards across the world. And every single person in a city like New York and in a city like London, you went into a hospital to get a vaccination and people would write down your name on a chit, Navika Kumar, age so-and-so, given a vaccination, so-and-so, and a pencil piece of paper was handed over to patients. In India, digitally, electronically, you got a COVID certificate on your mobile. Was that ever possible nine years ago? Now, if people refuse to see this, if people label a vaccine as a BJP vaccine or the fact that it has uh, 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 non-vegetarian meat in it and then three months later you see the same people lining themselves outside of vaccine vaccination center to get a vaccine themselves, that speaks to the hypocrisy of these people. Mr. Jyotir Aditya Sindhya, election season around the corner. Are you a contender for the Madhya Pradesh chief minister's top job? Hand on your heart. N uh, Navika has, in the 23 odd years that I have known her, has repeatedly asked me this question, and I don't know when I'm going to be able to satisfy her. You can't because uh, you, left, you left a certain party uh, to join the BJP. Uh, because last time around, they didn't keep up their promises to Not you. at all. I, I'm so uh, surprised and shocked oh to, my God. I, to, hear, to hear you make that statement. Let me be very clear, Navika. Uh, you've known my father. I don't know whether you, you knew my grandmother or not. But whether it's my grandmother, my father, 
and I have the same blood. This is not a family that has ever, ever in its history been after post opposition. Ever. My father, when that airplane crash happened, he was the first person to go in and resign. When the Madhya Pradesh results came out, and we had a conversation, we had a discussion, and the choice was made that Navika is going to become the Chief Minister of Madhya Pradesh. I said, absolutely, and I will support her completely. And I immediately went and made an announcement. My move from the Congress was not because of post, was not because of position. My move from the Congress was because the Congress party did not keep my self-respect. When I was humiliated and insulted by the chief minister in his chair, and I only asked for my self-respect, I did not ask for a position, I did not ask for a post, and I certainly didn't ask for this. But one thing I will not compromise with in my life, and that is with my self-respect. And I think that is the most important tenant for anyone sitting in this room. Absolutely. And so to answer your question, my race and my thirst is not for a chair. My life is about service. My life is not about politics. My pursuit is not politics. My pursuit is make, to make sure that Jan Seva is done. My father used to say a line, Navika, and it never made sense to me till he passed away. He said, Jindagi mein kabhi bhi laksh rajniti nahi honi chahiye. Laksh jan seva honi chahiye. Or rajniti keval ek madhyam honi chahiye us laksh ki purti karne ke liye usse jada nahi. That's the spirit with which I carry on my life. So no, my, my race is not for a post. My race is not for a position. Yes, but I am ambitious. And there's nothing wrong with being ambitious. I'm ambitious for peop my people. I'm ambitious for development. I'm ambitious for progress. So my thirst is for what projects can I take to my region? How can I change the lives of people? If I'm being given a responsibility, and the responsibility I've been given today by the Prime Minister of our country for civil aviation, what can I do to make sure that this area transforms itself in the period that I'm in command? That's the religiousness with which I work. Last, considering uh, you've spoken from the heart, I want to ask you, how different is it in this government than it was in the earlier government where you were a part of that government as well and uh, 2024 how how do you see you know with the recent victory in Karnataka the opposition seems to think that it's a done deal and they're back in the game for 2024 how do you see politics uh, shaping up over the next few months your first part of the question was what 2024, you've worked on both sides uh, ah, with both it's, governments? It's, uh, let me say it's, uh, it's a completely different transformation. If you ask me the, the one thing that is completely and starkingly different, or let me say two things. One, meritocracy. Two, result-driven organization. And so... Uh, my experience prior to politics was like you, I was in the private sector. Uh, I was a banker for six and a half years. Um, and the adherence to timelines, the ad adherence to delivery, the adherence to making sure that execution according to a certain plan is in place, that's what I had been trained for in those six, six years. And uh, I've had the, the good fortune and the privilege to work under a prime minister that is completely and totally focused on timelines and making sure things get done in, in the specific period that's been announced. One of the constant refrains that when we discuss, discuss about ideas and, and new ways of doing things is that we have, and successive governments before us, have put in place enough policies what we need to concentrate on is 100% saturation of every single policy that we have brought out. Until every single human being in this country gets the benefit of that scheme, we've got to keep at it. And that's the, the ferocity with, with, with which every person in this government under the PM's leadership is working. As far as election results are concerned and the recent result in Karnataka, I mean, every state will goes through its crests and its stuffs for every single political party. Uh, the Congress has won in Karnataka. I wish them the very best. I hope they deliver on their promises. 
But let me say this, that the Bharati Janta Party is extremely committed to its resolve of making sure that we transform India. We transform India to for each and every one of 140 crore people across the length and breadth of this country. And our ambition is to ensure that India today, which was at number 11 in terms of economic growth across the world in 2014, today it's at number 5. By 2030, our target is it should be at number 3. And before our journey is completed between Amrit Kal and Shatabdi Kal, India must be at number one in the world. As always, spoken from the heart, pleasure to speak with you, Jyotira Ditya Sindhya. Thank you for being with us at this very important forum of India Economic Conclave. Big round of applause. Thank for you very Mr. much for Jyotira having me. Ditya.